Today's guest is Professor Sylvia Secchi from the Department of Geographical and Sustainability Services. I had Sciences. to read it. Sciences. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, welcome to Rapid Response History. We're going to talk about liquid gold or fool's gold today, biofuels in the U.S. Um, and we always start this uh, lecture with a very short interview of our guest lecturer. So, um, could you tell us a little bit about what sparked your interest in your area of research? So, I hope you guys won't hold it against me, but I am actually an Iowa State grad. That's where I went for my PhD. Um, and so there's no better place to study the environmental impacts of agriculture, which is my broad area of research, than Iowa. Because we have a lot of agriculture and it has a lot of impacts. And uh, so that's, uh, you know, I was in the right place to study uh, this. And there's a, a lot of, uh, I, I work with a lot of collaborators, uh, with people in the IIHR, in the hydraulics lab. I work with people at Iowa State in agronomy. Um, I work with people um, in the rest of the Corn Belt. And so the, that's, um, that's why. Okay. And um, if people are blown away by your lecture today, which I'm sure they will be, what classes can students take with you, particularly next fall maybe? So next fall, I, how many of you are freshmen? Okay. And, and sophomores? Okay. So next fall, I teach a really big class that's capped at over 350 students. It's called a global environmental change. Um, change. It's uh, global environmental issues. It's uh, geography 1070. And in that class, we talk about uh, issues related to water, air, uh, climate change, which is kind of like the underlying um, umbrella or the underpinning umbrella uh, of this whole conversation. Uh, problems related to how we manage natural resources, uh, what kind of technologies we have at our disposal, uh, and things like that. And then in the spring, I teach environmental economics and policy because even though I'm a geographer, I'm in the geography department, I am an environmental economist, and so I teach environmental economics and policy. And next summer, I'm really excited about this. Next summer, I'm going to teach at Lakeside for the first time. I'm going to teach an environmental policy class related to water at Lakeside. So. Excellent. Okay. We can go paddle boarding together at Okoboji <laughs> if you take that, that class. Sounds good. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. And then I give the mic to you. Or you have a different one. Uh, I, yes. I'm, I'm mic'd up. All right. So um, the first thing I want to say is you can interrupt me and ask me questions. And you should remind me to repeat your question for the recording. So what is that thing up there? Yes? Yeah. No, it's not a horse's carriage. She is right. You know exactly what car it is? It is. Indeed, it is. It is a quadricycle. So it's the first car that Ford built. Why is it up there? They did not use oil. The first car that Ford built did not run on oil. What did it run on? What kind of alcohol? Ethanol. Ethanol. So what I want to do today is I want to spend a little bit of time at the beginning of the lecture, kind of like um, giving you the broad, uh, a broad overview of the use of biomass in general today. Then I'll go on to a brief story of biofuels in the United States specifically. And then we will talk about the pros and cons of biofuels, uh, particularly as it relates to um, the food and fu uh, versus fuel controversy and the, um, the role that biofuels have in mitigating climate change. OK? All right, let's see. So the first thing I want to remind everybody is that renewable does not mean sustainable. Okay? In the United States, for a very long time, the most important energy source was renewable. It was wood. That doesn't mean it was sustainable. There was massive deforestation, in part 
associated with uh, the harvesting of wood and in part associated with the clearing of land. Okay? The pioneers that homesteaded in Iowa in the 1850s, the first thing they did is they cut down the trees so that they could farm. Okay? Uh, and this renewable doesn't mean sustainable still applies to a lot of developing countries where people use wood as their main energy source. And uh, there's massive deforestation, uh, landslides, uh, water quality problems, uh, and so on and so forth, OK? Then what you see is you see here the, the three waves of fossil fuels. The first fossil fuel to be used was coal, OK? And coal was associated with things like running trains, OK? Uh, later on, it was used for things like electricity production. As the car becomes the, the uh, mode of transportation of choice, oil becomes more prevalent. And we are now in the third transition, where uh, natural gas is taking the place of um, uh, coal, particularly when it comes to electricity generation. Okay? Uh, just for your future reference, there are three um, ways in which we uh, use energy in the modern world. One is electricity. The second one is uh, transportation. And the third one is heating of um, houses in you know, places like this. Uh, the two main ones really, the, the two really big ones are uh, transportation, which is the purview historically of oil and where uh, biofuels come in and electricity, which used to be dominated by coal and is now transitioning to renewables and natural gas, OK? By the way, for those of you who are interested in this stuff, this document comes from the Energy Information Administration, which is an agency, agency within the Department of Energy that does an amazing work, uh, an amazing job at reporting uh, data and uh, information regarding energy issues, okay? So in terms of the biomass in general and then biofuels as part of biomass, fossil fuels dominate the picture, okay? All renewables and the split here between modern renewables, what would be modern renewables? Uh, no, you see biodiesel, yes, biodiesel is down here, OK? What other water renewables? Wind with turbines, yes? Solar. Solar, these are all modern renewables. But you see they only account for about half of the um, renewable uh, 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 energy share that we have. The rest is traditional biomass. It's people cutting down trees and cooking on um, open fires in their homes, eating, heating their homes, um, just using very simple implements that are very bad in terms of local air pollution. These, you don't want to have a stove burning in your house. Are not efficient. A lot of that heat is lost. Um, and as they are harvested, cause environmental problems, OK? So you can see that fossil fuels still dominate the picture, and you can see the, um, w where biofuels fit in, um, uh, in global terms. Okay. Uh, you can see where the um, biomass is used on a global basis uh, in terms of sectors. So biomass, modern biomass, um, is used, some of it for electricity, some of it for transport, like in the case of biofuels, uh, and a little bit to uh, heat, okay, whether it's buildings or industry. And uh, this shows the share of uh, renewables versus non-renewable, um, uh, uh, biomass versus non-biomass, so fossil fuels um, and other renewables uh, by sector. So as part of the overall biomass production um, system, uh, the two big fuels 
that dominate the market are um, ethanol and biodiesel, okay? Biodiesel tends to be, um, or has historically been more important in Europe. Why is it more important in Europe? Does anybody know? Yes, yes. Um, we don't have a lot of diesel cars, and um, after the uh, uh, debacle of uh, the German car manufacturers in terms of the, uh, how, how good diesels, uh, diesel cars are for uh, environmental reasons in the United States uh, that happened uh, last year, two years ago, uh, we probably won't see a lot of uh, biodiesel. Biodiesel, though, is very important for a specific uh, sector of, and, and diesel in general, for a specific sector of the U.S. economy. Who knows what that is? Who uses diesel? Uh, mm, not necessarily trucks that I'm thinking about here. Who I'm thinking uh, hits closer to home? Agriculture. Farmers. A lot of farm equipment is diesel. And so a lot of biodiesel is actually generated by the agricultural sector and used by the agricultural sector. But most, um, uh, most of the um, renewable fuels in the United States um, is ethanol because we mostly have cars that run um, using gasoline okay, and not diesel. So this is the situation in terms of the big players. Uh, of, um, for uh, biofuel production, and you can see that the United States is the first, both in terms of ethanol and biodiesel, but ethanol is a much bigger um, product globally. Uh, the United States and Brazil at one point, not too long ago, uh, were uh, on par in terms of uh, production of ethanol, but we've now surpassed them. And you can also see that biodiesel is uh, really dispersed, okay? The Europeans um, tend to be a relatively big player in terms of biodiesel, but it's a, it's a much less um, concentrated uh, kind of production. All right, so how did we get here? And by the way, Dr. Priest is going to talk about um, fossil fuels. And so some of the, the things that I'm going to say here today will fit with what he's going to talk about. Because the history of biofuels in the United States is, for many reasons, and you, we will see them in a second, inextricably linked to the history of fossil fuels, since they are substitutes for each other. Okay, so. At the beginning, when uh, we, uh, we, when uh, uh, American industrialists uh, develop uh, the automobile, it was not obvious that ethanol was going was not going to be the fuel of choice. Okay, um, the the quadricycle run on pure ethanol. The Model T was a flex fuel car, um, but what happened was two things that conspired to make ethanol less attractive as a fuel. One is the prices of agricultural products were high. So that would increase the cost of uh, things like corn or wheat or whatever you used as a feedstock uh, for the production um, of ethanol. And a lot of oil fields were discovered in the United States. So the price of oil goes down, the price of ethanol goes up because the price of corn goes up. That makes uh, the uh, uh, fossil fuels more attractive, okay? And the other thing that really matters, and this is something that you should keep in mind for the rest of the lecture, is that um, we started developing a distribution system for that, um, those fossil fuels, right? How do we move ethanol now? How does ethanol go from A to B? Do you know? You can't use pipelines. It's too corrosive, right? So ethanol relies on trucks. Hmm? 
Well, next time speak up. There's no, uh, there's no uh, negative point. So what we did is we started to develop all this infrastructure that could handle gasoline. We have all these pipelines. Uh, we have all these uh, cars that run on gasoline and have a limit on how much ethanol you can put in them. And so it becomes a um, self-perpetuating uh, system. Okay, And of course, then you create this big oil companies that have a lot of power, uh, and they want to keep their power. Okay, So, so we move to um, oil as the source of our uh, uh, fuel. But at the same time, because these, um, these cars had engine knocking, they essentially would stop. Okay? And they had, um, uh, the, it was not clear why they were stopping, but it was clear that they were stopping and that adding um, uh, things like uh, lead would stop the, this engine knocking from happening, okay? So we start putting lead into gasoline, which turns out is not a very good idea. Why is it not a good idea? Yes, okay? So the second part of the story of um, uh, biofuels in the United States uh, is related to two things. One is energy security and energy independence. Uh, so it's tightly coupled with what happened with the uh, 1970s oil crisis and the oil embargo. Uh, and then the second thing that happens is the, um, uh, the discovery that lead was not a very good additive and what are we going to do uh, about uh, additives in our gasoline. So in the 1970s, there were a lot of legislative actions. Um, a lot of this was actually spurred by President Carter. And uh, you all are too young, and I'm Italian, so I don't remember. Uh, but President Carter uh, was um, he, uh, mocked for appearing on TV in a cardigan and saying, we need to conserve energy, and we need to become energy independent. So uh, he pushed for this National Energy Act, uh, energy conservation. Um, alternative fuels, so uh, lots of um, uh, research. Oh, that, there's a typo there, I'll fix. Uh, research on alternative fuels, uh, research on conservation, okay? Then what, what happened to Carter? One term. Hmm? Yeah, so what happened? One term, what happened to him? Yeah, that, that's happened to him, and then who became president? Ronald Reagan could, would not be seen dead wearing a cardigan, okay? So conservation went out of the window. The, the um, energy crisis uh, was, um, um, uh, was no longer in people's, on people's radar. Uh, so uh, this kind of like driver disappears. But when I was at Iowa State working on biofuels in the 1990s for my graduate degree, I actually went back to papers written in the 70s because they were looking at some of the things we were looking at again uh, in the 90s. Okay, uh, we, so we, we lost a lot of years of research and study. So in the 80s, they start uh, uh, finding alternatives uh, to um, uh, uh, you know, that's part of the, where is it? There should be, oh, there it is. In, in the 70s, they start uh, phasing out lead and gasoline. Um, so how do you, uh, what kind of additives can you use? Well, N MTBE becomes the additive of choice. MTBE is a product that comes from fossil fuels themselves. What's up with MTBE? Do, you, do we still use MTBE? Hmm? Nobody knows about MTBE? What's wrong with it? It's another carcinogen. It leaches into the groundwater. Okay? When you put gasoline with MTBE in tanks underground, the MTBE leaches into groundwater and causes cancer. Okay? So um, 
In the 1990s, the story about ethanol is the struggle to get rid of MTBE um, and substitute it with something that's more environmentally friendly. And by the way, one of the reasons why MTBE became the additive of choice to make this um, gasoline burn cleaner is because people in places like California and New York did not want to give a boost to Midwestern economy. And so they were like, well, if we use ethanol, we're essentially subsidizing corn belt farmers. We don't want to do that. So, um, you know, cutting your nose to spike your face or something like that, they ended up with a carcinogenic in the water, okay? So um, the reason to have MTB or ethanol was to reduce smog. These additives make the um, uh, gasoline burn cleaner, so that problem doesn't go away. So in the 1990s, the, really the story is a story of uh, ethanol becoming a additive in uh, gasoline to help with local air quality problems. Okay. Um, there is some movement toward E85, so towards uh, uh, pushing for the sale of cars that can run on ethanol. Um, the problem is there is not a lot of E85 stations. Still, in most of the country, there aren't. And so a lot of these, uh, the people that bought E85 cars were not using E85. They were using um, regular gasoline, OK? So at the beginning of the new millennium, two things happen. Ethanol becomes the additive of choice. And then George Bush really makes a push to promote uh, ethanol, not just as an additive, but as, which would be kind of like a complement to gasoline, but as a substitute for gasoline, OK? Um, so there is a first renewable fuel standard in 2005. And then there is a second one in 2007, um, which we will talk about in a, in a second, that is the one that's still operational, at least um, nominally. Okay? Throughout this period, there had been subsidies for uh, blending ethanol into uh, gasoline. Uh, given the financial problems associated with the, the crisis of 2008, uh, these, uh, the, these credits expire, okay? But we're still mandated in the United States under that uh, 2007 law to use um, uh, certain amounts of renewable fuels, okay? This is what the uh, mandate says. It divides biofuel categories into uh, four groups. One is diesel, and you see how small it is. It's one billion gallons, okay? So it's not, it's not um, that much. Uh, then it's advanced biofuels. This includes um, imported sugarcane. Where does the sugarcane ethanol comes from, by the way? South America. Where specifically in South America? Remember that table that I showed you? Brazil, Brazil. yeah? So Brazil is the other big player. Um, and sugarcane from Brazil has certain positive characteristics and certain negative ones that we'll see uh, in a little bit. So the two big um, categories here are other sources, such as corn ethanol, which is the mature technology that we have, which is capped at 15 billion gallons. So this is a ceiling, OK? The uh, renewable fuel standard says, um, we don't need more than 15 billion gallons. 15 billion gallons, by the way, is approximately 10% of the U.S. gasoline consumption. It's what we call the bland wall. If you want to produce more than 15 billion gallons of um, ethanol, you've got to have cars that can take more than 10%, right? Because otherwise, you can't put it in there. So, uh, some of these things tend to become, a, a, I don't want to go too much into the weeds. I want to give you the big picture. Um, but the other big thing that really a lot of people had very, very high hopes for, the, the kind of like long-term vision for, the, for biofuels, was the production of cellulosic biofuel. 
What is cellulosic biofuel made from? Yes, some people speak Latin, right? Cellulose, yes? Yeah, but a little bit more specific, not just fiber. What is it? Well, what? So they, they made it out of wood. Wood, yes, absolutely wood. And things like you can use wood shavings, for example. So you're, you can use the byproduct of wood production. What else? Yes? Say it again. That's not cellulosic. That's starch. That's the technology we... We use the corn grain now. Cellulosic is, cellulosic or lignin is the new technology. What, where, what, what else besides wood? What else? Stover. Corn stover, yes, corn stalks. Okay, that's actually the primary, um, uh, in, in practice, that's the primary feedstock for. Uh, cellulosic biofuel right now in the country okay but the thing that people got really excited about was dedicated grasses so it was a way essentially to plant things like prairies again and harvest prairies and other perennial grasses for fuel okay so this is what the um, renewable fuel standard said we should be doing. When it was introduced, we were already at over 10 million, 10, sorry, 10 billion gallons of um, corn-based ethanol, right? And we were just going to ramp it up to uh, get to uh, 15, and that was going to be the end. But you see that big increase is the blue, the cellulosic biofuels. Okay. So uh, cellulosic biofuels uh, could be grown. Um, the cellulosic biofuel feedstocks could be grown anywhere in the United States. So you see here, this is a map that was put together by a national lab um, showing what you would use in various parts of the country. So you could use uh, coppice trees, so trees that grow really fast and then you cut them down. Um, you could use grasses like switchgrass, uh, which is a native grass, or you could use um, sorghum where you would, separate the, you would separate the grain from the stalk and use the stalk for, um, uh, for uh, feed the stalk for um, ethanol production. But in a place like Iowa, you would use a lot of this stuff, okay? Which is the byproduct of corn production. I once was at a meeting with uh, an agronomist and they said, oh, that's a waste product. And just, he just about killed me, so I don't say that anymore. Okay? It's not waste. Okay? It's, it's really important uh, whether you're harvesting it for um, feed, whether you're keeping it on the ground to provide habitat and to preserve moisture, or whether you're harvesting it for biofuels. The problem with cellulosic ethanol is that every year that there has been a mandated minimum level of production, the Environmental Protection Agency, which is in charge of the renewable fuel standard, has had to waive the mandate. Essentially, there is not enough production capacity in the United States to meet these 7 billion gallons in 2018. We're producing less than 1 billion. Do you know why we're not producing enough cellulosic ethanol? Cost too much, yes. And so because it costs too much, every year the EPA um, has to say, okay, we said it was going to be three billion, it's going to be less than half a billion, okay? So in, in, um, in some quarters, there is a, what is, you know, what you could call a cellulosic ethanol fatigue. We've been expecting this product to become competitive, uh, and it never has become competitive. What do you think is one of the reasons why, uh, or what do you think are the reasons why it has not become competitive? It doesn't have tax credit for it. What? It doesn't have tax credit for 
there is a tax credit for it that was not repealed in 2012. It's a, a, a dollar a gallon. No, so it's not the credit. I'm going to take a guess, but isn't it like too, it seems like it would be too spacious to be like efficient. That like. What do you mean by spacious? Like it takes, it takes up too much space to like transport. So if like you were to put it into a, a truck, it, would, it wouldn't be as efficient. Because there's no way to like compress it. So the problem is not the cost of the raw material. In, in places like Iowa, there is enough corn that you don't have to truck it long distances. You're not going to make this thing in uh, Washington state, right? Because you'd have to truck the feedstock across the country. But in a place like Iowa, you could. You could do it. Yes? Well, the enzyme technology is not there for one thing. The enzyme technology is not there. So what you need to break down that lignin into a, a starch that can, uh, can be used is, is too expensive. Can we let some of the young people participate? I know that this is, I know that you have all the answers, but they're here for, they're here for credit. <laughs> Guys, so what's another reason? Are you old enough to remember when gasoline was $4 a gallon? <laughs> yes. Is gasoline $4 a gallon? No. What does that mean for something like the ethanol market when gasoline prices are, uh, oil prices are low? It's bad, right? Because this is like economics 101. If you want to stand up in the marketplace, what you're selling has to compete with its substitutes, right? So when gasoline is at 100, when oil is $100 a barrel, right? Your prices can be up to $100 a barrel and you're competitive. If oil prices are $50 a barrel, it makes it so much harder for you to compete. Your prices have to be so much lower. So the story of biofuels and the story of oil is linked, okay? Because they, whether they are complement in terms of additives to um, breathe clean air, or whether they're substitutes in terms of um, oil being completely um, taken over, you know, the gasoline being uh, completely taken over by uh, E85, they are linked, okay? And so low oil prices have not been good for uh, the development of cellulosic biofuels, okay? Uh, all right, and on top of that, uh, there is massive restructuring in agribusiness going on. And so there were three commercial plants in the United States. Um, DuPont closed uh, one in Nevada. Nevada, I never can remember which one it is, uh, here in Iowa. And then the, the one in uh, Kansas went on sale, and so there is only the one in Emmitsburg now um, that's left, okay? So there is a lot of work being done, for those of you who are in the STEM disciplines, at the bench and pilot scale on this, but it's still not at the commercial scale, okay? So when the RFS to the Renewable Fuel Standard 2 uh, was implemented in 2007, uh, the rationales for uh, promoting biofuels uh, was uh, threefold, okay? One was national security. It was national security because we were importing a lot of oil, and so we, if we produce biofuels at home, we become less uh, dependent on foreign oil. What has happened between 2007 and today to that story? Increased uh, production of oil. What's the technology that allows us to do that? Fracking. Fracking, yes, yes. Fracking. So we now cannot tell this story anymore because we now have nationally produced oil, okay? So um, that was the first rationale. The second rationale was uh, that we were substituting a fossil fuel that was emitting um, greenhouse gases with a renewable fuel, okay? And we'll talk about this a little bit. And then support the agricultural sector. Why do you think I have an asterisk there? Uh, yeah, 
yeah, but that's, okay, I really hate it when you guys give me this kind of like super generic answers. Uh, because it depends on what. What does it depend on? Do you think all farmers are happy uh, that uh, we are producing more ethanol? What? So, so if, if we're thinking about the agricultural sector, who do you think benefits from ethanol? Corn farmers. Who do you think doesn't benefit from ethanol? What, what, OK, let me take a step back. This is a real test. If you don't answer this right, you're not. I, how many of you are from Iowa? Oh my god. How many of you are from Illinois? OK, all right. Minnesota? OK. Uh, Missouri? OK. Wisconsin? OK. Anybody from the states that I mentioned, you need to know this. What do we use corn for? Animal feed. What else? Uh, yes. Human consumption, uh, the, but it's, it's a heavily processed, right? And now what's the third thing? <laughs> now the, th the third big category is? Guys, what are we talking about here? Ethanol. ethanol. Do you know what the split is between feed ethanol and other uses? <laughs> Listen, I'm going to put you at the back of the class. What is this? This is the most unruly class I've ever taught at the University of Iowa. What did you say? 40%. So it's 40, 40, 20, right? 40 feed, 40 um, ethanol, and 20 um, other uses. Things like high fructose corn syrup, those fancy plastics, uh, you know, uh, that, that are biodegradable, um, all sorts of other things. So let me go back to my original question. You're going to have to suggest to somebody else. I'm on to you and that, that, that link. Um, who do you think is? not necessarily happy about high corn prices. Bingo. OK. Now, this has changed. Oh, I see. He's got lo lo longa manus, as the Latins say, the long hand. Uh, anybody's tainted that's in that area now. Um, so it, it's different now because there is a lot of reuse of the um, ethanol byproducts for feed. Okay? So there is less of a tension. But historically, uh, livestock farmers were not happy that their input costs were going up because corn prices were going up. Okay? So if you, and and the, uh, one other thing that uh, you should all know is that while historically corn and, um, or crop and livestock farmers were the same person, these two categories have become separated because of the specialization uh, that's occurring in agriculture and a bunch of other things that I won't get into um, uh, here today. So if you, in the old days, it wouldn't have been a problem because you know half of your farm was doing better and the other half was doing worse. But now, if you are a um, livestock farmer, you typically buy your feed. You don't grow your feed, OK? So that's why there is an asterisk, because this story is not necessarily true. Uh, for everybody. So when corn ethanol started, a lot of people uh, the, said, OK, besides reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, uh, you know, this is good for uh, a variety of environmental reasons. Um, uh, maybe corn ethanol is not uh, as, as good as other things. <laughs> Uh, but it's still pretty good. By the way, why is corn maybe not as good as other crops in, in terms of environmental profile? Use more water. Uh, in Iowa, corn is rain fed. So we, it just comes from the sky. If it's in Nebraska, that story is true because in Nebraska they irrigate. And so it does use water that has alternative uses. It's not as energy dense as other, like rapeseed or other. Uh, mm, yeah, yeah. 
now we're getting there. Yes, corn needs a lot of energy inputs. Haberbosch, anybody? What is that? Ammonia. Yeah, so what, do, what is the main input of um, the Haberbosch process that makes fertilizer? No, 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 I wish, no. Good old fashioned poop, no. What is the main input? It's not fish, no, that's, you guys, you guys are thinking like 19th century farming. <laughs> no, what's the main input? Hmm? Do you want to save them? Yes, natural gas. Natural gas, okay? So we use a lot of fossil fuels to fertilize the corn that produces the ethanol. This is kind of like a little nursery rhyme, right? That is used to substitute fossil fuels, okay? Things like sugarcane from Brazil is much better in terms of net energy balance. We use a lot less energy in the inputs um, than uh, we do for corn, okay? So there's issues related to the, that nitrogen, not just because of the fact that it comes from fossil fuels. What other issues may there be? What's up with nitrogen? You are in Iowa now. You better learn this story, guys, before you leave the room. Yes. By the way, in, in freshwater system, what is very uh, most often the limiting nutrient? Is that nitrogen? Phosphorus. It's phosphorus. In marine systems, it is nitrogen. Okay? So there are problems associated. Corn also uses a lot of P, of phosphorus. So there are problems associated with growing corn uh, because of uh, what it does to waters. Here in Iowa, <clears throat> and along the Mississippi River Basin, and then all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. Have you heard about the hypoxic zone in the Gulf of Mexico? All right? That's why people in Louisiana don't like us, okay? So, what corn, the increase in corn production has been doing um, is two things increase the production of corn where we were already growing corn, okay? This is what we call intensification. What was the traditional rotation in Iowa before ethanol came about? What did you grow corn, what did you grow after corn? Soybeans. Soybeans. Now there is more corn on corn. That more than doubles the input of uh, fertilizer, okay? So that's intensification in the same piece of land you grow more corn. The second thing that happened was that we had land, particularly in places like southern Iowa, that was out of agriculture production um, through a program called the Conservation Reserve Program, for example, that was brought back into production. We call that extensification. So you produce more intensification in the land that you were already using for cropping, and you use more land for cropping. That's extensification, OK? So this is what I just told you. Both these strategies have um, environmental impacts, OK? Um, this one here, the, the land use change on the extensive margin is really controversial, not in the United States, but in places like Brazil. Why would it be controversial in Brazil? Yes, because in Brazil, that increase in sugarcane production is happening uh, to the detriment in part at least there is decent evidence um, for uh, in the, to the detriment of rainforest and rainforests happen to be pretty good carbon sinks so again you're cutting down the trees and emitting greenhouse gases to grow a crop that is supposed to reduce the use of fossil fuels okay what did you say? I said that's redundant. 
that's um, uh, counterintuitive, maybe counterproductive, okay? So I want to emphasize that it's very difficult to understand what the impacts of the renewable fuel standards are because at the same time, other things were happening that were increasing the price of corn. For example, people in China were becoming richer and when you become rich, the first thing you do is you start eating more meat. And meat is a very poor converter of energy. So you need more feed to eat more meat. That contributes to the increase in the price of things like corn and soybeans. Okay? So it's not just ethanol is bad. Other things were happening at the same time that were contributing to this. Um, and you know, that's why I'm never going to be out of business because you know, the uh, the world keeps changing and you try and keep track of what is happening to it, okay? So uh, this is from the Economic Research Service, which is an agency within the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And you can see here how the first RFS and then the second RFS really changed the dynamic of the um, uh, corn market because historically the corn, corn market was uh, pretty much a feed market, okay? This trend, according to the USDA, this is from their latest projection, is projected to continue. So you see ethanol and feed. So these, these two um, uh, remain the major uses. These are exports. Most of the exports are for feed. By the way, uh, we don't um, export a lot of ethanol. So what happened at the same time? If, if um, I was working for, if I had been working for Monsanto, given this talk, I would say a lot of this is hogwash because we've been really, really good at increasing our corn yields. It's true. Corn yields have been increasing at an approximate rate of 2% a year okay, because of improved genetics. And it's true that the yields associated with the, uh, the, the, these improved genetics have not been associated with increased use of fertilizer. Okay? We're putting down a little bit less fertilizer than we were 20 years ago per um, acre of corn, and we're still getting these massive yield gains. Okay? But we are seeing an increase in the planted acres. This is coming growth from the intensive margin, that corn on corn instead of corn soybeans, and uh, from reduction in, in the land set aside programs. Okay, so yield, uh, the yield has helped reduce the environmental, the yield increase has helped to reduce the environmental impact of um, ethanol. This chart makes me weep because of where it ends. Things are not doing, uh, going well for corn prices right now. Okay, so there is, there's been a, Historically, what happened to farmers in Iowa was if the corn crop was good, the prices dropped because the demand for corn is inelastic. Okay? So it, once you have satisfied your demand, your extra corn, you don't need it. So the price uh, drops. But the increased demand associated with ethanol uh, ensured that for a good uh, 10 years, okay, we had increased production and increased prices. Now what we're seeing is that when we, we're back to normal, when we have increased production, the prices drop. Okay? This is not good for Iowa farmers, um, crop farmers, and uh, the whole agricultural sector. But if you look at the his, history of the RFS2, it has uh, tended to increase corn prices by I don't know, 30 to 80% with an average maybe of 40%. Don't quote me on that, okay? But something like that. Um, so this is the, the story in terms of the, uh, how am I doing in terms of time? How much time have I got left? You know, I can tell this story short. I can tell it long. I can tell it in my sleep without my hands on so, um, uh, 10 minutes? Yeah. 10 minutes more? Okay. So the, the thing that I want to talk about here is, uh, I want to talk about two things here. The first is biofuels impacts on food markets. 
and then impacts on uh, land use change. And, um, and then I want to finish with uh, some, some positive uh, thoughts about where biofuels can, uh, can be a contribution to the climate change mitigation um, uh, toolkit, okay? Bruce Babka was my major professor at Iowa State, and essentially what he says here is, you use land to produce corn ethanol that you would use for food products. So there is, to some extent, a, um, an impact of um, ethanol on food prices, right? Because you're using that land to produce corn that goes into ethanol and not, on, uh, and not for um, feed, okay? Now, is this a big problem for us in the United States? If the price of corn goes up by 50%? Yes, you agree with her? No, why not? The price has gone up by 50%, so it, you're paying more for corn. But how does that matter in terms of your food costs? Well, doesn't corn go to feeding the people in poor countries? And Remember, corn is used mostly as feed. U.S. corn is used mostly as feed or as ethanol. Well, he can't resist. Yes? 20% of the corn you raise goes, ends up as a feed product anyway. So is it a problem that corn prices went up by 50%? It's not as big as you'd think. In fact, in the United States, is a very small problem. Okay, these guys at the USDA did the math. Yeah. And if you look at the, um, the impact of a 50% increase in corn prices on the cost of a box of corn flakes, almost nothing. Why? Because all the cost of our food is in the packaging, the processing, the transporting, the storing, right? So it's... A 50% increase in corn prices would raise corn flake prices by 0.5%. Okay? It's a little bit different when you look at chicken, beef, and pork because then the feed costs are much more important as their costs. But uh, for, for chicken, it's 2.5%. Okay? For uh, beef, it's 8.7%. An increase of 50% uh, would mean an increase of almost 10%. But the thing is, hey, if burgers go up, you know, you can buy chicken and up, it not feel that pain as much, right? If the price of beef goes up by 10%, you can buy chicken instead, okay? It's a much bigger problem in developing countries because in developing countries, um, people, particularly poor people, use a much higher percentage of their income to buy food. So this is showing for the lowest 20, for the poorest 20% of the population in these countries, how much they spend on food. In Ghana and in Tajikistan, over 70% of the income of the poorest of the poor is spent on food. And the food they buy, let me tell you, is not cornflakes. It's not McDonald's burgers. Okay? In particularly in places like uh, sub-Saharan Africa where um, because of colonialism, corn has become the staple of choice, people buy big bags of corn. And so the, if the price of corn goes up by 50%, the price of their food goes up by 50%. Okay? So it's not a problem for us, it's a problem elsewhere. This is actually... Um, a map that was part of a paper produced at Iowa State um, by two friends of mine. And you can see here, as oil prices go up, corn prices go up because ethanol prices go up. And places where, what do, you, what do people eat in places like Mexico and Sub-Saharan Africa? Corn. Okay. They see the largest increases in their um, food costs. Okay. So that's one, one concern that people have, the land use competition, agriculture prices, and uh, malnutrition. Um, there's another concern in terms of 
uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, some of it is associated with uh, how much, as we've already seen, how much energy we need to produce corn ethanol as opposed to other biofuels and cor corn ethanol um, uses a lot of energy. Uh, and so uses, uh, you need a lot of land, okay? And therefore, it doesn't necessarily do much better than gasoline in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. But what I want to uh, talk about for the uh, last little bit is that, again, that doesn't really necessarily matter very much. If corn ethanol is a little bit better than uh, gasoline, we want to pay a little bit more for it, that's fine. The problem is, oh God, the problem is that when you change, when you do this same thing in places like Brazil or in places like Southeast Asia, where a lot of the diesel, the biodiesel um, feedstock come from, what you're doing is you're cutting down forests, which are very good at sequestering carbon to grow your palm oil or to grow your soybeans. And so as you cut down forests, you emit a lot of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, and you have to plant those um, soybeans, those, uh, um, sh that sugar cane, that palm, for many, many, many years before you get back that carbon debt, okay? So this is showing that if you cut down peatland, what is peat, by the way? Yes? Mm, what is peat in this peatland rainforest? Anybody ever heard of it? It's like decomposed plants. Yes. What, uh, in millions of years, what do decomposed plants become? Oil. So peat okay, is in the process of becoming a fossil fuel. Okay? So there has a lot of carbon. The first thing you do when you convert a peatland rainforest into a palm plantation is you burn all the carbon, all the peat. So you release enough carbon in the atmosphere okay, from the below and biomass um, soil carbon loss it will take you 423 years of growing um, uh, palm for a biodiesel to re re recoup your debt, okay? So biodiesel, corn ethanol, cellulosic ethanol, you've got to be smart about where you grow them, what was there before. Don't cut down forests, right, because then you incur a carbon debt, okay? So we've already talked about some of the other environmental problems in the United States associated with uh, uh, biofuels, nitrogen and phosphorus, the Corn Belt. Uh, I won't have time to go into this, but uh, how can we do them right? How can we do biofuels right? How can they help us mitigate climate change? Okay. We can plant things that don't require a lot of inputs, like prairie grasses. Okay, um, this is showing the energy balance for those uh, prairie grasses, and they don't use um, they don't use as much um, um, energy inputs as things like uh, corn and soybean. Okay, um, use best practices. If you use your stover, make sure that you're not you, um, doing uh, taking away the stover and on higher erodible land and stuff like that. Um, let me see. Use them in places where they do a good job. So, for example, uh, I'm, I'm working with some people looking at uh, planting biofuel crops in areas where um, it floods a lot. And instead of building houses on the floodplain, you put biofuel crops. So when they get flooded, some of them are flood tolerant, so they won't even die. Okay. Uh, do it on highly erodible land. You can plant trees on highly erodible land and harvest those. Or use them from, not, not that it applies to a lot of Iowa, use them as part of a prescribed forest management plan. So they have a place in helping us mitigate climate change, but they ha you have to consider the impacts of um, changing land use. You have to consider the impacts of adding all this... Uh, uh, Let's see, let's see, let's go back to the 
um, nitrogen and phosphorus fertilizer um, in watersheds. Okay? I'm good? I'll take questions. No questions. No questions. Yes. Oh, she's, she's got the mic. She's going to make it official. So, hello? I don't know, it's not working, I don't think, is it? Why don't you ask and then I'll repeat it. All right. Uh, so I was just kind of, from the lectures we've gotten, I've kind of gotten an, I've kind of gotten like an impression that, I don't want to say it doesn't, that a lot of our efforts to mitigate the causes of global warming are sort of ineffective in a way, and that too much energy is spent focusing on the causes and not enough on what will be the eventual effects of global warming. Like, and we should be focusing more on managing the effects as opposed to managing the causes. So I'm going to be back here tomorrow to talk about the, the state of global climate change negotiations. So this is uh, one of the things. What you're saying, uh, translated in the language that people use in the climate change literature, is we should focus on adaptation and not on mitigation, right? We're not going to reduce the temperature. We're going to have sea level rise. We're going to have more extreme events. We need to live with those. Um, and I think that's actually what's been happening. When the Kyoto Protocol that in practice collapsed, people said, OK, Mitigation is not going to happen. We need to do adaptation. Um, I think what people are figuring out now is that we really need to do both. Because if you don't mitigate, okay, and the temperature goes up, you know, four degrees centigrade, you're going to have to do a boatload of ad more adaptation, right? If sea level rises more, you're going to have, you're, you're going to lose the like, coastal areas and big parts of the world. You're going to have to move large populations. It's going to cost a lot of money. Um, there are some things called no regret uh, policies, which are good both for adaptation and mitigation. So for example, you should build your buildings so that they are able to withstand more um, extreme events, uh, that they're more energy efficient, uh, they consume less energy, right? So there are ways to combine those two, but really you have to do both um, to, to be prepared. No more questions? Boy. Yes. So <clears throat> until recently, it seemed like there were other options besides cane and corn. Uh, you had palm and sorghum in there. I've, I've heard of things like rapeseed, and you said uh, native grasses and things like that that were much more energy efficient to create biofuels. Why haven't those other products like rapeseed and uh, well, natural rapeseed grasses? Is actually used in Europe to produce. Rapeseed is a first generation feedstock. It's used in Europe to produce uh, biodiesel. Okay. Uh, grasses are a second generation feedstock, and that's because of the reasons the, the enzymes being too expensive, uh, oil prices being too low. That's why those haven't come, um, haven't become mainstream. And I've, I've been doing this for 20 years, and every five years people are like, oh, we're there on the verge of a breakthrough, and the breakthrough hasn't happened. So it's a cost issue. It's a big, it, it, if the costs of those enzymes don't go down, um, we're not going to, uh, unless they, the government could make us, right? But you know how contentious it has been, even in Iowa, to promote biofuels when oil prices are low. So. Yes? It is probably too broad of a question to answer with the short amount of time, but like, what about our other options like nuclear and, of course, the other things? If you were taking my in environmental economics class, I would say you have to use a portfolio approach. Because obviously, at this stage, we don't know which technology is going to become dominant. And so you want to invest in all of them. Um, one of the big things that happened to, has been happening to the environmental movement in the last 20 to 30 years is that a lot of people that were anti-nuclear have become pro-nuclear. 
because nuclear is carbon uh, carbon free, right? Once you build that plant, you don't generate any greenhouse gas emissions. And so a lot of people have said, we need to move to more nuclear energy uh, if we want to avoid climate change. Uh, so there are all sorts of, we, we don't know yet if, you know, uh, batteries are going to come online to a, an extent where, um, you know, wind and solar will become the only thing. And what, what has been happening is we've moved away from coal, again, for price reasons, uh, into natural gas. And natural gas is better for greenhouse gas emissions. That's actually what has helped mitigate some of, of our um, climate problems, because we're using a lot more natural gas than we were uh, before. But I would say all those things have to be considered other fossil fuels, natural gas, carbon capture and sequestration. So you use fossil fuels or biomass, and then you capture the CO2 from the, um, from the plant and you put it underground so that it doesn't get into the atmosphere and heat things up. You have to consider uh, solar, you have to consider energy conservation, you have to consider all your options. Because right now, we don't know which one is gonna um, make that big leap and save us. Yes? So, if battery technology comes on, then will, will you lose ethanol? I mean, at this point, we've lost the subsidies and we're still producing about 15 billion gallons, right? This is a mature industry that has a place in the uh, marketplace because of the uh, smog problem, so it's an additive. I don't see ethanol going away. I don't see ethanol, even if we get rid of the mandate, at this point we have all this infrastructure built, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think ethanol is, not going, is going away. What I do think is that cellulosic ethanol has to step up the game if we really want to increase the amount of ethanol we produce. And so far, that has not happened. No. And, you know, as I said, it's 20 years and it hasn't happened. I have DuPont plant. <laughs> They're out of the business. And that's the research. <laughs> so Another I, question. I guess I have one question. You, you mentioned that uh, the, the, what is it, the fertilizers had a lot of like blowback related to pollution. Mm -hmm. how, how is that comparable to like the same blowback that uh, comes from fracking? Because I remember Bernie Sanders made a very big push against fracking, while Hillary was very for fracking because they were, he was afraid of the unintended consequences of fracking. So I was thinking, like, you, I didn't even know there were unintended consequences of fertilizer, so I'm thinking, how are they comparable? So uh, for a lot of these things, uh, the story is that you trade one form of pollution for another. The main, so with fracking, the main concern that people have no, it's not earthquakes. It's methane emission. Because now we don't capture the methane at the, um, at the well. There is no policy. And so if you emit methane at the well, you are emitting green, a very potent greenhouse gas. Okay, That's the, the main concern in terms of green, uh, greenhouse gases. In terms of water, what is it that they're putting in that water? We don't know, right? Because there is a Halliburton loophole, right? So all these chemicals are proprietary, so we don't know what's going into groundwater, okay? So you could say, if people capture the methane, maybe we're trading water uh, pollution uh, for um, clean air, right? Because uh, natural gas is better than coal. Uh, what I would tell you, and I would tell Bernie Sanders, is that there is no free lunch when it comes to energy. There is no source of energy that does not have negative unintended environmental consequences. Nuclear disasters, right? I'm from Italy. When Chernobyl happened, we, we got radiation all the way to Italy, okay? Nuclear has uh, drawbacks. Wind energy has drawbacks. Solar energy has drawbacks. Biofuels have drawbacks. It's just like any, anybody that tells you this is a win-win situation is selling you crap. Okay? As a society, we need to decide what kinds of pollution we can live with 
and limit that pollution. But there is no energy source that is completely energy free. And we are here using the sun. The sun is a massive user of land. Okay, if you if you have to put those uh, panels all over the place, some of that land is used for other things like growing crops. You know, it's it's not so easy. I when I um, before I came here actually, they there was a in, in my previous institution, they were going to put a solar panel um, uh, farm, okay, in, on a super fun site. Guess what? The local people were terrified because that Superfund site had creosote in the soil. And they were afraid of disturbing the creosote and it was going to end up in the water when they were working to put it in the farm. There is nothing. There is, I can find a negative environmental externality for pretty much anything except energy conservation. Even renewables. For in the Pacific Northwest, hydropower is a big problem because it disturbs the, um, the movement of fish, which is a very important economic resource. There is no energy source that's going to save you. You've got to make a decision about what ne negative impacts you want to live with. Did I answer your question? So it's basically the lesser evil. Yes. Now, what you need to determine that is good data, right? You, can, you don't know how bad it is if you don't have the data. So I would always advocate for finding the numbers of what the environmental impacts are. Otherwise, you're just going in. Like it happened with MTBE. Actually, people knew that it was going to be a carcinogen. And they still used it. If you read the story of how lead was putting gasoline in the 20s, they knew it. They knew it was going to cause cancer. And they still put it in there. That, that's not smart. I just want to know what you think about the whole um, uh, the lead, uh, Flint and lead case. How much time you got? <laughs> um, so, in terms of data, that I certainly think that right. Just to pretend that we don't have a problem, right? And because we don't see it, that's ridiculous. And this is a problem we have in this country, not just in Flint and in um, urban water systems. We have a problem in Iowa here because we don't know what's in our well water. And that's the water that people in the countryside are drinking. And that water is not tested and not just for nitrogen. And what, what happens when you have too much nitrogen in your water? Blue baby syndrome. Blue baby syndrome. But it's, that's the least of our problems. What about antibiotics and pesticides and other emerging contaminants? If we don't test, we won't know what's in there. Okay? The water bill that the Iowa legislature just passed has no money for testing, by the way. We're going to do all these things to clean the water up, but we're never going to measure whether the water is really clean. Okay? So the first thing is you can't make science and you cannot make good policy without <laughs> data. Data is not sexy, data is not exciting, but data is the foundation for science. So this is what I tell everybody. That's why the people like the, the geologists are like, oh, she likes data. Yeah, no data, no science. No science, no good policy. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing I would say is uh, that the environmental history of this country is inextricably linked to um, justice, lack thereof, okay? If Flint had been a white city, things would not have happened the way they have. Why is Washington, D.C. the next Flint? White people live in the suburbs. So let's not be blind, right, to why these things have been allowed to happen in some places and not in others. Why are there a disproportionate number of Superfund sites in communities of people of color in uh, places where uh, Native Americans live? It's an environmental justice problem. By the way, I don't teach this class, but Dr. Eric Tate in geography teaches environmental justice and um, 
So if you're interested in that, I, I would say let, that's a good cause for you to take. Did I did that get to it? We're good? Thank you, guys.